what a great crowd. Hey everybody, my name is Jeff Williams and uh, maybe some of you have seen me on uh, some YouTube videos or Facebook uh, over the years, but I really appreciate you guys coming out to the Catfish Conference. Isn't this a great event? You see Steve Douglas and some of these other guys, um, thank them because this is, a, this is a really nice event. It's great to be able to come out here and, and meet all of you. I've had a lot of fans over the years come by the booth and shake my hand and, and buy some products. So um, we're really proud to announce that uh, Team Catfish is in nearly 2,000 Walmart stores this year. We're at Bass Pro, we're at Cabela's, we're at Academy, we're going into Sportsman's Warehouse. I mean, you can find our products all over the country. If you know, if you have a local tackle shop in your area that you like to buy products from, have them get a hold of us. And we want to be able to supply your, your local tackle dealers. So, uh, but you know, even though as many places as we are, there's a whole lot of places that we want to be and there's a whole lot of people learning how to catfish all over the country. So, as most of the folks that are here are from the Midwest, Ohio area, Kentucky area, let's see some hands. Okay, I'm from Oklahoma. We got anybody else from Oklahoma in here? Missouri? Okay, we got some Missouri. Tennessee? Okay, all right. So, a lot of Illinois, okay. Texas, yeah. Kansas, let's see here. Florida? All right, well that's wonderful to have you all here. And like I said, what a great event. Um, so today they brought me in to kind of talk about some of the different species of catfish, flatheads, blue cats, channel cats. It's not all the same catfish. You don't fish for those catfish the same way. You shouldn't target them the same way. The anatomy of the catfish is not the same. They don't have the same habits from season to season. So you really have to figure out today what fish am I going to go fish for? Am I going to fish for channel cats? How many people in here fish for channel cats? Blue cats. Flatheads. We got a nice mix, okay? That's wonderful. So, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy and how these catfish are, are built. Let's just look at one, okay? Now, you all have seen a lot of catfish. I didn't bring any pictures or any videos up here with me because I really like to talk about this stuff. Now your channel cat, if you look at him, he is built with an overbite, okay? If you look, his top lip goes down, okay? He's got a fork and tail, and that dude is made to where he can swim a long way, he can swim r pretty fast, and they're made to pick things up off the bottom. It's a lot harder for a, a channel cat to, to rear up and eat something, even though they do eat suspended baits from time to time. But you really need to look at the anatomy of these fish and you need to look before, and, and it, as you do, it really starts to kind of make sense of how I should target them. So the next fish that we have is blue catfish. Again, overbite, okay? Not quite as an aggressive of overbite as a channel cat. Blue cats do do a tremendous amount of suspended out in, in sometimes they suspend behind wing dams, they suspend out in, uh, out in open water. Uh, they also feed on the bottom. They, blue cats are a lot more notorious for chasing live shad or live skipjack or golden eye or moon eye or something like that. Uh, your channel cat, he, st he will eat live bait sometimes because they're all opportunistic, but your channel cat doesn't always target live bait blue cats will target live bait they will literally get on a pattern and that's what they want sometimes from day to day is is uh, live bait now I've spent a lot of you know I've spent a long time fishing for catfish but the last three years I was a catfish guide at Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri I was fishing specifically for blue catfish over 200 days a year and I learned a lot about catfish I learned a lot about blue catfish and one of the things that uh, we really like about blue catfish is the size of the fish, of course. You can catch really large fish, or you can catch some small fish, and I recommend taking fish that are like 28 inches or 30 inches down for, to harvest. Those are, to me, those are the best fish. Um, 
So, and, that's where we're, and I mean, we're gonna get into a little bit about the seasonality of how to target these, but I wanna talk about a flathead because I think out of all three species of catfish, the flathead is probably the most misunderstood and it is lumped into the group of catfish the easiest, okay? Now let's look at the anatomy of a flathead. The flathead has an underbite like this, not an overbite. He's got an underbite. If you look at him from the side in the front, his top jaw goes down underneath his bottom jaw. So he's built to feed different. It's a different critter. His body is a lot flatter. It's a lot, it, it's, it's not quite as sleek like a blue cat and a channel cat, and he's got a round tail, okay? The round tail is a big indicator, and the, and the underbite are big indicators of what that species, how he feeds. So flatheads, for the most part, I believe, target live bait. You people catch them from time to time on cut bait. I think a lot of times that cut bait is moving, or it's made of vibration, or it's wiggled, or a rod's been pulled, or something caused that bait to move. But for the most part, if you're gonna fish for flatheads, you need to fish with live bait. So, flatheads really like to lay in structure. They like to lay in rocks. They like to lay in weight. You know, the catfish, the camouflage on a flathead's a lot different too, okay? Channel cats are, you know, kind of tan looking with a couple little specks. Blue cats, of course, are, are, you know, in muddy water, they're really white, and in clear water, they're, they're blue, slate gray, kind of a shark looking color. But a flathead, he's camouflaged. He, he's, he's built to just lay around in a, in a wood pile, looking up and waiting for something to swim by, and he just reaches up and hails it. Now, if he has to make a short, quick burst, he's got that round tail to give him all the pushing power he needs to go after something with a short strike. It's a different tail than a fork and tail like you find on a blue cat and you find on a channel cat. So, targeting these fish by the anatomy and by the, the, the traits is how you should be looking at catfishing. Don't put all cat, don't say I'm going catfishing. I'm going blue catfishing today. I'm going flathead catfishing today. I'm going channel catfishing today. And you know, there's a lot of times you'll have some crossover between channel cats and blue cats. But once you learn how to target these fish, you're gonna be a lot more successful, okay? And I also, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna ask if there's a few questions at the end of the, end of the seminar. But now that we've really kind of discussed the anatomy of a fish, let's talk about the seasonality of a fish, okay? So when I was a guide, I had to learn how to capitalize on these fish from season to season. They're predictable, okay? They just, they just are. But the, the water temperature, the length of daylight, all of these factors drive the instincts of these fish to behave differently from season to season. So we have four seasons here in the Midwest and you really need to fish for your blue catfish, your channel cats and your flatheads differently. For the most part, your flatheads really become dormant once the water temperatures drop down below about 45 degrees. They, the, a, a fish are cold blooded, so their metabolism slows or the metabolism heats up as the water warms, which brings up a good point. A lot of times in cold water where the fish has a slow metabolism, he's looking for a smaller bait, okay? His body is not burning as much food as he does when the water's warm. Now that's, don't, don't take that to heart, but you always remember that, that sometimes if you're struggling to catch fish in the winter, you might be fishing with a bait that's too big, especially on cold front days bluebird skies and days when the fish might not be quite as active. So, flatheads become pretty dormant when we get into the winter months, all right? Channel cats can be somewhat dormant. Blue cats really remain active all winter. 
The thing that really kind of kills the blue cat fishing in the winter times a lot of times is a shad kill. We have a, we have a gizzard shad kill or we have a thread fin shad kill and these shad these shads start to die off once your water temperatures drop below 42 degrees. Gizzard shad and especially thread fin shad, they go into what we call thermal shock. And have you all seen shad washed up on the banks or seen shad floating after you have a hard cold front or you know, have, have we have shad kills all over the Midwest. It happens on rivers, it happens on lakes. So a lot of times that shad kill can really, it's, I call it like rain and cheeseburgers. I mean, there's just, there's just shad everywhere, okay? These shad are going into thermal shock and they swim and they flutter and they swim and they flutter. The majority of them sink to the bottom. Some of them sink, not sink, they rise to the top. A lot of times when they rise to the top, you'll see a lot of gulls work in an area, okay? And these gulls will follow these shad uh, up to the banks. So with that being said, that leads me to a pattern in the wintertime for blue catfish and some channel cat. Okay, a lot of times during a shad kill, if you will fish the shallow water on the windy side of the lake, that is where a lot of that winter shad kill is being blown. It's being pushed up onto a sandbar, onto a gravel bar, up onto a mud flat. And that is a pattern that you can take advantage of as a channel cat fisherman, but especially as a blue cat angler, especially on reservoirs that are really, really loaded with lots of bait fish, okay? Blue cats just don't quit, and it doesn't matter if it's 32 degree water, it just, they just keep on biting as long as there's not so much bait in the water, so much shad in the water, that they become full. They're just completely gorged with all of the, the free food. Uh, channel cats, you know, it's just kind of a hit or miss there with those guys. Sometimes they take advantage of that winter kill, that winter shad kill. Uh, sometimes they don't. They're just not as active in the winter time. They're not as aggressive in the winter time as blue cats are. So let's move from winter time into springtime. Now the flatheads really start to become somewhat active a lot here in the Midwest, usually in the, about the end of March, April, May. That, in that period right in there, our flatheads really become active. The water starts warming up, the length of the day starts increasing, and the, and the fish really, really start becoming a lot more active. Channel cats really start to become active once we're dealing with water temperatures about 45 degrees. And again, blue cats just never slow down, okay? If you can find them, you can catch blue catfish. So, um, that's one of the things that I want you to, to consider is kind of that water temperature and that time frame. And a lot of times in the spring, fish have feeding and spawning on their minds. So anglers will target fish in a feeding pattern or sometimes in a spawning pattern. So you need to look at that again by species and then you need to look at that by season. So when you start putting all these variables together, then you start to be where you can really capitalize on the catfish. So a lot of times in the spring, like I said, they're up in shallow water, they're aggressive, they're moving, they're coming out of the uh, winter kill and um, you know, the, the, the water's warm, a lot of the shad are also thinking about spawning, so they're moving shallow, so the predator fish move up and follow those shad. Has anybody ever heard the wind blew all the shad up to the one side of the lake, or the wind was blowing and that's where all the bait fish are on that side of the lake. The wind blew them up there. The wind didn't blow them up there. The wind blew the zooplankton up there that they feed on. Think about that too. And that's another little thing I want to talk about because I'm going to talk a little bit about night fishing. I fish mostly during the day because I've learned how, to learned how to target all these fish during the day. I would rather fish for them when they're stationary in a piece of structure or positioned on a drop off or in a wood pile or something. At nighttime, a lot of these fish do move around. They become shallow, the shad become shallow and they start to move around and they move around a lot more. But during the day, the, the, a lot of times the shad are deeper and they all have to feed on zooplankton in the water. 
So as nighttime approaches, a lot of times the shad will come up, they will be shallower, and your predator fish start moving around. They start following these shad a little, and a lot of times they'll follow them into areas that are, um, you know, mud flats, gravel bars, long points that stick, stick way down to the lake. Um, do we have a river fisherman versus uh, reservoir fisherman, bank fisherman, river fisherman? Let's see your hands. Well, we're going to have a lake fisherman. Man, this is, every, this is quite a mix of folks. So um, you can target these fish differently in reservoirs versus um, rivers. Um, one of the things that I want you to consider is current dictating to any species of fish where it has to live. In a lake, you have some wind and you have some wind waves and, and, you, know, and you have fish that are moving around, but for the most part, if they're in a river, the current is dictating to them where they have to live. They're not just gonna swim out in the main current all the time. They're gonna push off in somewhere. Um, they're gonna push into an area where there's a current break where there's a piece of structure or wood, a rock, an old car body, an old sunken barge, or whatever it is, and they're gonna escape that current. Again, areas where you can target these fish. So current is a lot different than fishing uh, reservoirs. And when you really start to define it, you have to think about where would a fish be hiding in the current, why would he be there, and target that fish there, okay? Reservoir fish, they, they still like drop-offs, they still like edges, they like ledges, they like brush piles, but there's nothing that's really dictating to that fish that he has to stay there. So a lot of times they don't, they're not quite as predictable. But at night, when you have fish that move out of deep water into shallow water to target bait fish, they become predictable, especially in the spring and the summer and early fall, okay? So most of the catfish start to spawn around 75 degree water. That's when, that's when you see a lot of spawning. You can take advantage of all three species in rocks or riprap or areas where they go to spawn. A lot of times they'll spawn in 10 foot of water or shallower and a lot of, you know, you've got big long bridges uh, that are made with big riprap rock, you know, big big boulders that they've put in, whether it's on, whether it's on a uh, lake or a river. And um, so you can, you can target those fish in that big rock. You can use bobbers. You can, you can use a, a rod and, and dabble. You know, a lot of people will use a rod and, and they'll put a piece of shrimp or a, a fiber nugget or something on it and they'll, they'll just stand on those big rocks and they'll go like this. This is really popular back in Oklahoma. And they'll get along those bridges and those fish that are moving in to spawn, they will be in those holes. And they're not really hitting the bait because they're hungry. They're hitting it because they're trying to remove it from their nest. They're picking it up and carrying it out of their nest because they guard their nest, okay? They're like all other fish. There is one of them that is going to be guarding the nest. So if you drop a piece of shad or a shrimp or something into their nest, get ready. Because if it's a 40 or 50 pound fish and you got eight, eight foot of line out, you're going to have a tiger by the tail. They'll pull a rod out of your hand if you're not prepared. So um, that's one of the ways that you can target these fish by water temperature and by season. Okay? So, you know, we have thermoclines in reservoirs. Thermoclines are a dissolved layer of an oxygen, and a lot of times in a big, in a big reservoir, that, that layer of oxygen is so low below the thermocline that fish can't survive, okay? They can kind of swim down there, but they gotta come back up. And if they stay down there, they'll die because the oxygen level is not real high, okay? So again, that's another key to being in the summer, when this thermocline starts, you're not gonna probably fish in 60 or 70 or 80 foot of water on a reservoir. Now in a river, where you don't really have thermoclines because the water's constantly churning and moving, you might be able to catch some summertime blue catfish in 60 or 70, 80 foot of water. So again, I come back to my point about targeting the fish by season and learning 
the species and how to target the species. Okay, I hope, and I, I hope everybody's really, if you walk away from this seminar with one, you know, you know, one thing that you've learned is I really, really want you to break out and distinguish the fish from season to season. So we move into the fall. Um, well, let's back up and talk a little bit about reservoirs. You know, in the summertime, the reservoirs, a lot of people drift fish for catfish. Um, a lot of people will anchor fish in shallow water at night for blue catfish and channel catfish. If you're going to target flatheads at night, um, fish shallow. Flatheads are, for the most part, you know, flatheads are not a fish of really deep water. I think a lot of times people fish for flatheads way too deep. And in the, in the reservoir that I live on, 50,000 surface acres, um, we, we catch flatheads in pretty much from year round from 10 foot of water to four foot of water. That's their preferred range. Flatheads are, you know, they're gonna go down and they're gonna stay in deep wood sometimes when you got current, but when you're in a reservoir, fish for flatheads in shallow water, especially at night. Flatheads will get out and move around a lot at night. They're gonna target bait at night, but they're not gonna swim around a whole lot like a blue catfish or a channel cat. How many people fish at night? Okay, flatheads, blue cats, okay. Well, personally, I don't ever blue cat fish after dark. I blue cat fish during the day because I want to be able to target those fish where they're living at during the day rather than having a fish come to me. Now, if you're a bank angler, that's a little bit different. Okay, but definitely a lot of times nighttime can be the best op opportunity for you to catch fish if you're a bank angler. So a lot of times bank anglers have to struggle with access, but instead of sitting around someplace too long as a bank angler, I would be concentrating on trying to find more locations to fish. I would also really concentrate as a bank angler for, for catfish in general on fishing different depths away from the bank. You've, you've all seen the bass fisherman that's got the boat and he's got the whole lake to fish, but where does he come? He comes up by the bank to fish. Well, the bank angler, he goes out and he gets, and he throws far out as he can go. So somewhere between there, you've got a lot of active fish. Just because you're a bank angler doesn't mean you just have to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. I would fish some lure or some baits extremely close to where you are. Fish some baits a long way, okay? Try different baits. Don't get stuck in a rut. But if, and you know, sometimes if you cast parallel with the banks, you know, there's all these tricks that you need to be doing as a bank angler to become more efficient uh, being a bank angler. Bank anglers can be somewhat limited, but it can also be very good but, you, but the worst thing that can happen as a bank angler is just to go sit down in a chair somewhere, throw out rods where you threw them out and you caught your fish last time, and hope that they're there again. You need to be able to work the water column. You need to be able to pay attention when you're casting. Again, let's say, and blue cats and channel cats can really, 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 this can really make a big difference. So. I'm a bank angler and I'm casting, all right? I throw out and I threw over to that uh, curtain wall over there. I'm not just gonna set my rod down with mentally trying to figure out how deep my bait sank. Count that bait down. I like to use the same size sinkers when I bank fish because I'll cast over there and then I'll cast out that way. And for some reason, if that felt like that was a little deeper over there, I'm gonna know because it took a little bit longer to sink. That can be the determining factor on you being extremely successful from the bank. If I cast over this way and I notice it's a little bit shallower and I start catching fish a little bit shallower, I know that I need to be filtering, feeding more rods up into that area. So really pay attention to how deep you're fishing, how far you're casting, and try to use, you know, I use three ounce sinkers a lot where I fish. I, I got a pretty good idea of how deep it is from the time that sinker hits the water till I feel it hit the bottom, okay? Now, fish in the fall 
whether you're in a reservoir or whether you're in a, in a, in a river, become very, very aggressive. The fall is a great time to catfish, but a lot of times people don't catfish in the fall because they deer hunt or they duck hunt or they bird hunt or, or you know, whatever. But the fall is a great time to go out and catch catfish. And a lot of times they will, they will be, be stuck between that shallow area and starting to go deep for the, for the winter pattern. Now, I said flatheads don't usually go deep, but flatheads will winter in some deeper holes. They will winter in, you know, 30, 40 foot of water, but they really become inactive. So, but channel cats and blue cats, a great place to target them is on drop off areas or areas where they're moving from shallow water to deep water. Okay, those are great places to target fish in the fall, whether it's a channel cat or it's a blue cat. Man, I, let's see, I started this 1215. Okay, all right. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our rods and reels. I'm gonna talk a little bit about fiber nuggets. Does anybody have any questions about targeting a fish or the anatomy of a fish from season to season? Do they school? Okay, that's, that's a really good question. I can tell you something that's pretty interesting about that. I don't think for the most part that flatheads are a schooling fish, okay? Blue cats and channel cats do school, but I think out of all three species, the blue catfish school by size more than anything. A lot of times if you catch schooling blue cats, if you catch two or three fish at the same time, they're all gonna be somewhat about the same size. And if you drift through them again, or you know they all move in, they do school. Does it, does, has anybody ever seen how hard a blue cat hits? They just, man, they, I mean, a lot of days it's just like, I can't believe a fish hits that hard. Okay, so one real interesting little thing that, that uh, I got to do when I was, had kids was um, back when I was guiding a lot, I caught some little blue catfish in my shad net, my cast net when I was catching shad for guide trips and I'd catch a few little blue catfish in there. And you can't believe how those fish will fight over a bait. Don't see it so much with flatheads, and I don't see it with channel cats, but I'm convinced that the reason that blue cats bite so hard and so ferociously is because a lot of times there's another blue cat in the area with him in a school, they, you know, or another fish, and they will literally try to pull another, pull a bait out of another fish's mouth. So they bite it and they run with it. And they, they, want it, they don't want another fish to try to get what they just ate. So I think, you know, it's kind of a cool little tip. We would see, we would drop little pieces of worms in, in the aquarium and they would sink. And if one of those blue cats hit it, there'd be two or three more of them just run up and try to hit his face and try to stick. They could have went and ate the, ate the worm themselves. But for whatever reason, they tried to get it out of that fish's mouth. So it's kind of interesting, and that's a good question. And the, you know, they're going to become a lot more solitary in the spring, and when they're trying to spawn, they're not going to school at that point in time. As you move through the summer, I think they start to build up in schools, and then as you re as you get into the fall and winter, especially in the fall. I think you see a lot of schooling fish, but I think a lot of schooling fish, whether it's crappie or bass or Kentucky bass or smallmouth or whatever, I think fall is the primary time that you see a lot of schooling fish. I didn't hear you. Yeah, that's a whole different animal there. Yeah, I mean, most of the time they're shallow. Uh, they're, you know, not real deep. Uh, most of the time the water can be, you know, somewhat more static or a standard temperature. Um, fish and bait are definitely going to move toward that hot water area, that hot water outlet. Um, when it gets really, really cold, you know, those fish have a comfort zone. I can't tell you exactly what that comfort zone is, but if you've got a hot water outlet or a warm water outlet, that's where I would be concentrating on trying to target some fish. Spawn? 
I would move out away from the hot water area about when the water gets about 75 degrees and I would start fishing the rocky areas or riprap or, or shallow areas. Um, and typically there's a bridge or there's some, something in those hot water outlets, hot water areas, or somewhere there's a bridge that goes across the lake, or there's some riprap piled up somewhere to keep erosion from happening. Those are great areas to target spawning catfish. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you very good. Probably a good question. If you fish cut bait, mm -hmm. I don't know if you did. Sure. For blues, do you find it more advantageous to put two dropper hooks on one single line to suspend two different levels? For suspended fish? Yeah. Okay. If you're drifting? Yeah, for suspended fish, definitely. I don't think <clears throat> if you're fishing off for bottom or bouncing the bottom, um, you can you can use a, a you know one on top of the other, or if you're in a water column. But when I'm anchor fishing, I don't. But when I'm fishing, a lot of times when I'm fishing suspended fish or like bump fishing or controlled drifting, yes, I use two baits a lot of times, for sure. I don't tie them and I don't tie them one behind each other. I'm trying to I'm trying to target two different depths. And his question, his question was, um, if you're if you're fishing for drifting for suspended fish like in a river, a lot of times. Um, you know, the catfish have eyes on top of their head, so, you know, they are going to be able to pick stuff up off the bottom, but they also see baits coming to them that are above them, and they can sure reach up there and strike them, especially blue catfish. They, they will, they will, it's amazing how fast you can be drifting sometimes and, and catch blue catfish. So, okay, um, one of the things that I'm really proud of, I don't know, has anybody ever fished with Secret 7? or a sudden impact catfish bait? Quite a few people, okay? So Secret 7 was the first manufactured bait uh, that I came out with back in 2007. And we released sudden impact fiber bait in 2010. And this year, uh, we've got a brand new product called Fiber Nuggets, okay? How many people fish with manufactured bait? Stink bait, dip bait, whatever sometime or another. Yeah, it's at some point, okay? Well, historically up until now, it's been really hard to fish with. Even the dough, even the dough balls and the and the bagged bait is you got to kind of mold it around a treble hook to get it to stay on. It'd be very difficult to, to get it to stay on, especially in current. So what we did was we went kind of back to the drawing board with our sudden impact fiber bait and we came up with fiber nuggets. And this product is a manufactured bait. It's just, it's the same formula as Secret 7 and Sudden Impact, except it's got a lot of micro fine hair like fibers in it, and you're gonna be able to use it on a circle hook. So all you gotta do is hook it on, cast it out, and that's it. Now it is gonna dissolve under the water, and if a fish hits it, yeah, more than likely, he's gonna knock it off. But one of the tips I want to tell you about manufactured bait is it gets a bad rap because a lot of people say it doesn't stay on. Well, a lot of times it stays on better than you think it does, but when you let it soak out in the water for 20, 30 minutes, it does get soft. And when you reel it back to you, that's when you lose the majority of your bait, especially if you're in current. Now, I don't know if a lot of you have ever thought about that or not, but a lot of people throw it out, they let it sink, they set it out there 20, 30 minutes, and then all of a sudden they reel it back in and there's nothing there and they're like, well, I was sitting out there with no bait on. But more than likely, if you were using a dip tube or you're using sudden impact fiber bait where the fibers grab the hook, you had bait on your hook until you reeled it back to you and it all came off. This product's gonna allow you to put three nuggets on an ADOT hook. It's gonna allow you to cut a nugget in half and use a one-aught hook for smaller catfish. So I'm really, really proud about this. I wanted to build this for three years 
I think this is going to be our number one selling catfish bait in the, in the next few years, which is going to be, uh, it's going to be a big deal to have to take over the Secret 7 or Sudden Impact sales, but we can't hardly keep it in stock right now. At $7 a bag, we got it down at the booth, and I would really like for you to encourage you, if you use manufactured bait and you're tired of using treble hooks all the time, you're tired of trying to mold that bait around your hook, try this right here. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the rods and reels we have, okay? Um, casting and spinning, who likes casting? Spinning. Man, you all are the half and half crowd, for sure. So, um, we got a rod and reel special going on right now in our booth, everything's, uh, you can get a rod and reel combo for 125 bucks, which these pieces of equipment right here, if you buy this online or buy this one online, it's about $220 with shipping. So we got a really, really good deal. I do this every year at the Catfish Conference uh, for all of my fans, and it's the only place that I offer these, uh, these bargains like this on the rods and reels. You can get two reels for 125, you can get two rods for 125, and uh, I'd encourage you if you're looking for one. Um, there's a lot of good rod, and rod manufacturers out there. You know, I see people roaming around here with rods all the time. I just want to talk to you about some of the features of these and what I think you should look at. Um, a lot of times people buy rods and they use rod holders and they don't really take into consideration what this is in a rod holder. If you're buying a split, split grip right here, a lot of times they don't work as well in rod holders as, or as, as something like this where this hard foam sets in that rod holder sturdy. Whether it's on a, in a bank or in a boat, you really don't want to use, it's, it's more difficult to use a split limb in a rod holder. This is why I've always went with an, a really long butt on, on all of our rods. I went with an end cap that comes, comes right out of the rod holder. That's something you want to look for. You don't want, you don't want a flared edge or anything right here to help impede you, you know, when that big cat grabs a hold of something. So we got a good foregrip. Really important to me to have a good foregrip where you can fight your fish. Um, I really like for our rods to have double wrapped guides. A lot of people don't know what double wrapping is. They don't really understand that. But as time, as time goes on, if you don't have a, a thread under wrap right here underneath your guides, you can damage, these stainless guides can damage your rods of all the flexing that they do. You know, time after time, time those, those guides somewhat, you know, they, they're, they're somewhat mobile, especially after the lacquer starts to break down. And uh, if you don't have an under wrap right here, a lot of times when people break a rod, they break it right around one of these guides because there wasn't a bed of under wraps underneath here to take the abuse of that foot flexing over time, all the time you cast it and everything. So that's something that I'm really happy to offer. Um, I've got braced stainless steel guides. We've got a guide that's un actually an arm that's underneath the ring. We've got stainless steel and these are an e-glass white uh, EVA rod. Oh, that talk about the reel. Um, been selling these for about five or six years. That is a gold ring 400 spinning. It's got a power handle on it. It's got two cast controls, which are really important. If, if you're new to bait casters, or um, if you're having trouble casting out in the wind, say you're, maybe you're fishing with big baits and you're trying to throw a long way and you get an overrun or you get a backlash. We've even got what I refer to here as a wind uh, you know, a wind dial right here. This is kind of like an extra fine um, dial to help keep you from getting backlashed. So, um, oh, a cast control, star drag that clicks, 6.1 to 1 gear ratio, power handle, a really, really solid reel. Some people are used to seeing uh, spinning reels. Uh, you know, some people prefer casting over spinning. Again, the same, all of my spinning rods are two-piece. I've got five different models of spinning rods from seven foot six medium all the way up to 12 foot. Again, they're at under wraps. All of the 
all of the guides on these rods are pressed in stainless steel guides that are flared on the back edge. It's important. I mean, you, you don't like to knock the, you know, you don't like to knock your guides, your rings out of your guides. So we push those in there and we flare them on the back side, makes them really, really hard to get out of there. They're not two piece. Uh, big, heavy stainless steel hook keeper. Again, long handle, sets in rod holder, really, really nice. Uh, good foregrip. Um, all our rods got a soft tip, soft action on the tip, lots of backbone. So, you know, you, you, got, a, you got a rod that's working for you on the tip to help kind of de detect strikes. And then our reel, I put a really heavy bait a bale on this. If you look at the size of the bale, who's notorious for just putting a rod in their truck or the boat and it sits there and rides there and, it, you know, it's a banging like this. I put a really, really heavy bale spring in this and I put a really, really heavy bale on it. This rod also has the bait feeder with a tension control right here. The, the casting reel also has a bait, bait runner, but if you like to fish and you like to let your bait run like a clicker on a casting reel, okay, this has got that feature on it as well, and you can control how tight that bait feeder is with this drag back here. Your star drag or your front drags are for when you're fighting a fish. Okay, that that's going to let you fight your fish, crank it down. If you get hung up, break your break your line or whatever. Um, this one automatically also engages once you reel, or you can cast, put it in, however you want to do it. Um, those are some of the stuff, some of the things that we offer at Team Catfish. Instant and I reverse really really smooth they got a one-year warranty on the rods and reels so i want to mention that um, and again i want to mention the special it's 125 for a combo or you can get two reels or you can get two rods or you can come down and say hey man what do you sell me a what do you sell me two reels and a t-shirt for or, or whatever our t-shirts are twenty dollars uh fifteen dollars twenty dollars for the long sleeve thirty dollars for the hoodies and we've been selling them like crazy so um I've got about another 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, is there any questions anybody would like to ask? That's uh, 12 pounds. Yes, sir. I fished, I lived in Truman, I lived at Warsaw, and I, but I fished, in the springtime, I fished all the way down to the 50 mile marker. And then in the summertime, I drift fish at the 50 mile marker. And that's about as far down as I wanted to go because of the boats. <laughs> yeah, really good fishing at Lake of the Ozarks. Really good fishing. Any more questions? What's that? Am I pop? Oh, the fish grip. Okay. Have anybody used these? Okay, I've been selling these for 10 years. If you've got a kid or you're sick and tired of getting bit by a fish, you really need to get some of these. These float. Now, my fish grips cost a little bit more than the other fish grips that are on the market because we use an entirely different plastic in ours than the orange ones or the blue ones or the red, white, and blue ones or whatever else the other ones are there. So um, this fish grip still floats. It locks down on the fish. Um, we recommend you put it in your hand, you reach down, grab your fish, pull him in, take your picture with your fish, drop him in the live well, whatever you want to do. And it's something that a lot of people don't really utilize it for, even though there's a hole in the, this thing weighs just a few ounces. So you can snap it on a fish, put your scale in here, and you can weigh your fish without having to try to poke a hole in the fish's mouth or hook him up under the gill and, and damage the fish's gills. They also work great when you're filleting fish, especially, you know, when people fillet fish and they're putting their hands, their fingers around the gills and they're trying to fillet those fish. You can grab them with the lip, fillet them, flip them over, fillet them, take this, dump the carcass. So it's a great tool to, to utilize. And uh, if you've got kids, this is one of the very best tools uh, that you can um, use to help get kids involved in fishing. You get kids out there that are not used to holding fish, they're not used to touching fish, the worst thing that you can do 
is just force it on them, okay? Give them a fish grip, give them a fish, let them wall it around, let them play with it, you know, and let them become comfortable with it, and you'll be surprised at how much faster the, uh, a, a child uh, will accept uh, handling a fish with a tool like this. And that's important. That's one of the things that I can speak a little bit about. Um, it seems like I've been in the tackle industry for either guiding or selling fish and tackle since I was about 18. I started guiding when I was 18 years old. I'm, I'm 48. Seen a lot of things happen since I started Team Catfish in 2006. The one thing that we all as tackle manufacturers are very concerned about is the amount of young anglers and young hunters that are not participating in fishing and not participating in hunting. It's, it's really alarming. So, um, you hear it all the time, take a kid fishing, but it's very, very important. I, I see a lot of people in here, a lot of you know, middle-aged guys that have some experience. And if you just take one kid, one kid a year fishing with you, we really need to continue to do that. And the reason why that is so important is because we have a whole lot of kids growing up that don't understand the hunting and fishing lifestyle. They don't understand what it's like to harvest and eat, eat fish or harvest and eat animals. And fellows, I'm telling you, or all of you, we have people, uh, the American Sport Fish Association has people fighting tooth and nail in Washington to help keep your right to fish some places uh, alive. And if we don't have the young voters and we don't have people that are engaged in, in the outdoors and hunting and fishing, by the time I'm 60 or 70 years old, or by the time some of you guys are, that are my age are that old, there's, all I'm gonna say is this, it's a dwindling amount of, of young people that are interested in, in outdoor sports. So um, please keep that in mind. And um, I, I just take them to a pond, uh, spend a little bit of time with them, shoot, just watch a video with them, do anything to help introduce them to fishing. Let go, let catch bluegill, whatever, doesn't really matter. So I'm probably gonna jump down off here unless we've got any more questions. Um, I re okay. Okay, very good question. A lot of times your blue cats are gonna be in an area, they're gonna be, say your thermocline's at 25 feet, okay? That 25 to 30 foot range right in there is gonna be a really good area to drift fish, okay? If you're marking some big fish below that, chances are those are blues, but they're not gonna be down there very long, okay? So a good, th a good rule of thumb is, is if you've got a thermocline, you wanna fish about the same depth the thermocline is at. You want to find some structure or a drop off or a mud flat or something that you can anchor on or drift over because that's where the majority of those fish are going to be. They're not going to be below that. They're going to be right in that area. So, you know, there's a lot of open water that's deeper than that. But if you can find where that thermocline goes up onto a mud flat or a, or a drop off or something, a lot of times a lot of those fish will be right there at that depth. Great tool for that is a slip bobber too, if you want to target a certain depth. Anything else? Okay, y'all. I appreciate your time. Um, come see me. I'm at the I'm at the end of the uh, back there, rod and reel fiber nuggets. Um, I really hope you all are successful out there this year. I hope I taught you something. Remember, target them by species. Target them by season, and you'll be a lot more successful as you, as you move on through your catfish experiences. Thank you.